All right, we are live. Welcome to another episode of Roasting Marshmallows. My name is Rolf Seward and I'm your host. So I've been a software engineer for about 15 years now and uh, I can count the amount of times I've personally spoken to an actual user or customer of the software that I helped to build on uh, one hand. And uh, when you stop to think about it, it's actually kind of sad. Um, in most companies that I've been in, uh, we relied on a single person to feed the team with features, bugs, and other work that needed to be done. In many cases, this person was just prioritizing requests and bug reports from the most vocal stakeholders. And is this really the best way to develop a product? Are uh, companies maybe scared to let engineers talk to their users and customers? Uh, so, uh, two colleagues of mine who are in uh, the podcast as well today uh, have maybe experienced the same kind of uh, behavior. And Hik and Arno, welcome back. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So, do you guys any ever spoke to a single customer? Yes. Yeah, all the hands. Yes, I agree. But you can that. also maybe count. Maybe two hands. <laughs> okay, so it's it's definitely uh, not normal. Well, well, it should be normal, but it, it doesn't happen that often, I suppose. No, not really. All right. Yeah, and uh, you know we want to develop our products in a, in a better way. So uh, today we have invited Teresa Torres on the podcast today. Uh, Teresa Torres is an international acclaimed author, speaker, and coach. She teaches a structured and sustainable approach to continuous discovery that helps product teams infuse their daily product decisions with customer input. She's coached hundreds of teams at companies of all sizes, from early stage startups to global enterprises in a variety of industries. She has taught over 7,000 product people discovery skills through the Product Talk Academy. She's the author of the upcoming, well, not upcoming anymore because it's released and I actually have it on Kindle here, uh, but uh, yeah, Continuous Discovery Habits, and she blogs at producttalk.org. Welcome on the show, Teresa. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. So is, is it, is it ter Teresa or is it Teresa? Like what, what do you uh, prefer? Teresa, although I'm okay with either. Teresa. Okay, no, but uh, you know, whatever yeah. you prefer, we'll, uh, we'll go with it. Yeah, so, so what do you think about us only have spoken to like a handful of customers in like 15 years of, of, of software engineering? Like, how do you feel yeah, about that? Yeah, unfortunately, it's all too common. I think we, um, as companies started to shift towards more sort of digital products, we took a really IT mindset of here's some requirements, just go implement them. We'll just tell you what to build. Go be an order yeah. taker. Um, thankfully, we're starting to see a shift in that mindset. It's going to take longer than we would we all hope, but um, I think we're mm -hmm. headed in the right direction, which is good to see. Yeah, and is that also one of the reasons that you wrote the book, or is that like just your experience in the last years? Um, yeah, that you said like, okay, I need to write, I need to write this down and, and get yeah, a book. it is a big part of the reason why I wrote the book. I think we um, in business, it's really easy to fall back on our functional roles and sort of say, I do this, you do that. Um, but I think the best teams mm -hmm. kind of set that aside and say, look, we're a bunch of people. We have different skills. We're trying to serve our customer. What's the yep. best way to do it? And I think um, especially on the engineering side, it's really important to get engineers involved er much earlier in the process um, for really like tactical reasons of avoiding handoffs and making sure everybody understands what and why they're building. Yep. But I think also just for really yep. human reasons, like I don't think anybody wants to be an order taker. Everybody wants to have a lot more sort of uh, um, authority and kind of be more empowered than that to be part of solving real problems. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I definitely, uh, so, agree. I definitely oh. agree with that because I think my in my beginning of my career, where I think it was one of the most frustrating thing was being excluded, or at least the feeling of being excluded. And then in the end, people would ask me for all the crazy things of estimations <laughs> and how long it's going to take. And I'm like, how did you even come up with this? So I definitely relate to that uh, pain point you described. Yeah. Or like a salesperson uh, promised something and uh, it's like, how can you promise this? Like we can yeah. never do this. Or you never even it? spoke to us, right? So it's, uh, it's yeah, that last one yeah. is sadly really common, right? Why you should be able to do anything. Why can't you just do this? It's just yeah. a button. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just not the button on the page. Indeed. And, uh, so, and then the sad, sad part where you actually do it is not used. Yeah, that's... Like nobody yeah. uses it. And that, or the yeah. fill doesn't even go through. You, you know, know? That's, that's part of what really um, gets at me is we're wasting a lot of people's lives building the wrong stuff. And that's, you know, like the tech yeah. industry is full of really bright people that I feel like we could be having a really positive impact on the world. Um, but a lot of people are brought in too late in the process and we don't get to leverage all their creativity and all their expertise. Um, and I think we could just avoid so many wasted hours. Yeah. Is, is guess, there a, go ahead. Go ahead, I know. Oh, I was just wondering because your story is about the product perspective. 
do you have any advice from the well let's call it the technical part of it because i think that's the part i struggle with the most you get a feature in like okay you can build it but there's little explanation well you know how it goes i'm just wondering if you have any advice for me or anyone else listening like okay how do you handle it from the tech side to change the conversation to something yes yeah, so i will say i wrote the book not just for product people not just for product managers but for yeah. product managers designers and software engineers um, one of the big ideas in the book is that those three roles need to be collaborating from the very beginning, right? So um, I think we need to do away with this idea of a product manager writes requirements and a designer designs and an engineer writes code. Obviously, we have those sort mm -hmm. of um, skills that we're going to fall back on and we're still going to do those things. Yeah. But in addition, we need to all come together and collaborate and figure out together what's the right thing to build. And I think for engineers in particular, like they may feel like they're the, the least empowered to enact change on their team. Um, but I think you'll be pleasantly surprised if you just start trying to build some of those peer relationships and get involved earlier in the process, even if your organization isn't saying, hey, we want you to do this. It might, yeah. in some companies, yeah. it might have to be yeah. like on top of all the other stuff you're doing, right? Because a lot, a lot of companies think like, oh, your yeah. value is to write code. Um, and so you'll have to chip yeah. away yeah. at like, actually, I can do other things too. And you should let me because here's the awesome benefit that comes from it. So why do you think of, that? Oh. Uh, so why do you think that companies still are a bit in that mindset that the engineer should be like somewhere in a basement because they're you know guys on slippers with uh, with beards and you know watching a terminals all day? You know why is it so? Uh, you know I don't yeah, think it's hard I don't for think them. It's unique to engineering. I think business um, we want things to be neat and tidy. We have org charts with clean lines, and everybody has a role to play. And we and like. The number of times I hear people talk about we need role clarity, we need to define the boundaries between me and you. I actually think that's exactly wrong. Mm -hmm. I think we need blurred, blurred role boundaries, and I think we need to remember. Like I often use this analogy of like, if you were a kid like trying to build um, a fort in your backyard out of whatever you could just scrounge up, you didn't have like one kid be mm -hmm. like. I'm really good at hammering nails, so I'm the nail hammerer. And somebody else be like, I'm really good at finding stuff, so I'm going to go scrounge up stuff from the neighborhood. Right? Kids just got together, and they played, and they built things, and, and wow. creativity emerged. I do remember a friend being a boss. <laughs> but, well, there's always those. You can't get rid of those. Um, yeah. Okay. And I think it's important that we remember, like, as kids, we were great at collaborating. Um, business culture yeah. kind yeah. of pushes against that. It, it tries to encourage us to, to go in our neat and tidy little boxes, but I don't. I don't think a lot of creativity and innovation happens from those neat and tidy little boxes. Yeah. Like his, did you uh, realize that working as a, a product manager, or like how, when did you come up with, or did you make the same mistake as all like most of product managers when they start to so just like write the requirements and giving this to the developers? When did you realize like, hey? This is not right. Yeah, so first of all, I always spanned boundaries of roles in every job that I've had. So my first job, I was both a front-end software engineer and an interaction designer. Uh, in my second job, I was an interaction designer and a product manager. Um, so I just it really, even from day one, I always spanned roles. And so I never really thought about them as distinct roles. I just thought about it as I'm a person on this team and we got to get this product out the door. Um, but I, I'm not the person who created this idea of the trio. Um, it's been around for a long, long time. Uh, it's often been referred to mm -hmm. as a triad or a th the three amigos or the three-legged stool. Um, I like simple language, so I think I did introduce the term the trio, um, but I, the mm -hmm. I did not originate the concept. It's been something that's um, becoming much more prevalent in the industry probably over the last 15 to 20 years. So, but that's uh, interesting that you mentioned the uh, three amigos because that is a practice that we're uh, also currently using at one of our clients, or at least like the client would like to use it. And um, we're just refining amongst ourselves as the three amigos. But then, is that the right approach to take? Because like no external stakeholder is ever involved in any of these yeah. refinements. It's like okay, the three amigos. Okay, we have some questions for the for the product owner, and then the product owner says like, okay. Uh, let me ask, you know, the relevant stakeholders, but this is like a total wrong approach to the, to the process. <laughs> yeah, right? well, so part of this is that in order for the trio to work, they have to be empowered to make their own discovery decisions, right? And we're not there in a lot of okay. companies. And mm -hmm. a lot of companies, discovery decisions, the decisions we're making about what to build are still being made by our senior stakeholders that are sitting in a room with no customer contact thinking that they have all the answers, yeah. right? And again, that's just 
business culture, we're swimming upstream against like a hundred years of uh, business is all about having the right answers and being able to predict the future. And mm -hmm. thankfully the internet kind of ripped all that apart and said, actually the world moves really quickly. You're going to be wrong more often than you think. Um, but we're going to see business move very slowly towards kind of recognizing this. I will say 2020, like the silver lining of going through a major global pandemic from a, from a like software building mm -hmm. standpoint is that everybody got a pretty healthy dose in how quickly the world can change. And if you had a five year yep. strategic yep. plan before 2020, you probably had to throw it out. Right. And I, and, and I think, <laughs> I think some yep. good is going to come out of that in terms of accelerating <clears throat> uh, business culture, recognizing that, Hey, we need to be a lot more agile. And I don't mean that in the big A sense, but literally more responsive and, um, and able to respond to what's happening in our market. Yeah. All right. And um, so one of the first things in your book that you mentioned uh, that the product trio should be doing is interviewing the, the, the customer. Um, and, uh, you know, you also recommend to automate the recruitment process. But even before that, like, uh, for example, if I just uh, put it to myself when I was going through college to get the you know, engineering degree, we never really got to learn like how to interact with with other people. And then we actually had like uh, courses. We actually had courses that, that forced us to go to different uh, different educations to, you know, to also see what, what's happening there and to hopefully get a bit more, you know, social mm -hmm. interaction. Uh, so do you think, uh, you know, engineers or like product trios also need training for to, you know, to ask the right questions? Because, yeah, that might be hard, right? Uh, you, you also mentioned that as well, like the type of questions to ask and like how to, to phrase them and to frame them. And what, what kind of advice could you give uh, people? Yes, yeah, so I'm going to give it advice that may sound contradictory, but I'll, I think it as, a, as a, one is an evolution mm -hmm. of the next. So first of all, having a conversation with a cu like interviewing a customer is just as simple as having a conversation. So I think if you can go out and meet a friend for a beer or a coffee and you can have a conversation, you're mm -hmm. qualified to interview a customer. Um, now, right. I think well. once you've sort of reached that level, you have to start to think about um, okay, how do I increase the reliability of what I'm hearing in my interviews? And that's where it takes a little bit of mm -hmm. skill or um, experience with how to interview well. And that's simply because humans are susceptible to cognitive biases. And if we, ask, if we don't ask the questions in the right way, we're going to get answers that don't necessarily mm -hmm. reflect the customer's behavior. And we want to be careful that we're not exactly. building a product um, based, on how people, based on what people think they do, but instead actually building the product based on what they actually do. So in the book, I talk about just some right. really simple techniques to increase the reliability um, of what you're hearing in your interviews. And the key concept is to keep people grounded in specific instances in the past. So an example I give is I don't, I don't want you to ask some, like most teams tend to err on things like if they work at Netflix, they're going to ask things like, mm -hmm. um, what do you like to watch? How do you decide what to watch? Where do you watch? What device do you watch on? And the challenge with all of those questions is that your brain is going to come up with the really fast answers. But we know from like um, Amos Tversky's and, and Daniel Ta Kahneman's work on cognitive biases that a lot of our fast answers are just shortcuts. So they're just mm -hmm. whatever was easiest for our brain to conjure up. And they don't necessarily reflect our experience in reality. So some, if you read any article on the internet about how to interview well, it'll say, well, ask open-ended questions. I can ask you an open-ended question, yeah. like tell right. me about your experience on Netflix. That sounds like a good question. But you're still going to speculate about your behavior. It's still unreliable because when do you ever sit yep. and reflect about, huh, what do I do on Netflix? And you're not going to take the time to do it. I watched three. Yeah, you're not going to you're not going to take the time to do it in an interview because it's it cognitively it takes work and your brain works really hard to avoid work. Um, so it's really all about how do I keep you grounded yeah. in a specific instance? Tell me about the last time you watched Netflix, and then my job as the interviewer is to pull out that whole story. Right. Yeah, and I think that's also very hard because like at least a lot of the customers that I visit, they come, I think, I don't know why, but all the times they say, oh, yes, I asked them if they need a new UI and all of them said, yes, so I need a new <laughs> UI. And then suddenly they prioritize that. I was like, but like if somebody asks if you want a new car, you're going to say yes, yeah. right? Like everybody's going to say yes to this question. But I think it's pretty hard to get out of this mode of asking the easy questions because I think also people want to hear what they want to hear, right? I mean, how, because I think that's the, my trap as well. If I'm going to ask a question, I'm going to guide you in a way that my question is going to, you give me the answer that I'm expecting. And then I just go to my team and, yes, guys, that's what they want. But like, is there also in a cognitive bias thing? 
Yeah. Um, so a little bit of confirmation bias is coming into play. You're only going to hear the things that confirm um, what you want to hear that's going to validate your already existing idea. Mm -hmm. um, a little bit of it is just um, when to interview well, you have to suspend your own ego. And we think about ego as like arrogance, but I mean it in the sense of like sense of self, right? So you're, if you're asking questions yep. from your sense of self, it's going to be biased by your product ideas, what you're trying to learn. And really, we have to do a lot of work to suspend that and say, okay, actually, my job as an interview is to, in an interview is to really focus on the customer, understand their world and how they think about things, and set aside for a minute what it is that I think and what I want. Um, and that, it's, it's a very deliberate action. In fact, so I teach a continuous interviewing course where, we teach, where people get practice um, interviewing in this style because it does take practice. It does take skill building. Um, and I tell people, I tell our students, if you're not exhausted at the end of an interview, you're not interviewing well. And mm -hmm. because to do the work to suspend your ego and to really focus on the other person and to create space for them and to let them tell their story takes 100% of your cognitive energy. And so you do walk away feeling really drained. Um, and that's actually a really good sign that you're on the right track with your interviews. And that's why like some teams schedule like four interviews in a row. I can't do four interviews in a row. Like, that's just too exhausting. Um, right. So that's, that's one way to, like, to evaluate. Like, am I on the right track with my interviews? If it just feels like this really easy, casual conversation, nothing's surprising you, you're probably falling prey to those biases right. that are interfering with you getting reliable feedback. Right. And there you go, only, go. Uh, I was just wondering, like, should I only ask the questions that I have for the customer, because like we're a product trio after all, like should we as a trio come up with a, a, a list of, of questions to ask or should we all individually interview the customer or how does yeah, that Yeah, that's work? a really good question. I, you know what? So a lot of teams generate these like three page discussion guides and they end up interrogating the, their customer. And it's a really terrible experience <laughs> for everybody, right? Like nobody wants to be interrogated. The product team doesn't really yeah. learn very much because they get a lot of <clears throat> shallow answers to many questions. I really encourage teams yep. to just come up with one or two questions. And really what you're thinking about is, okay. what are the stories that you want to collect? So you can generate that 4,000 page, that 4,000 question, three page discussion guide. You can just brainstorm. What are all the things mm -hmm. we want to know? That's fine. Get that out. Because everybody has a million ideas about what they want to know. And then you can look at that set of questions and say, okay, what's one or two stories we can collect that will get us those answers? So again, I'll go back to this Netflix example. Um, I, I might want to know a million yep. things, like how often do you watch, where do you watch, who do you watch with, what device do you watch on, do you have a good enough internet connection, how do you decide what to watch, what criteria do you use, how many episodes do you watch? I could generate like 50 mm -hmm. questions, right? But I can get answers yeah. to all of those questions grounded in a single story. Tell me about the last time you watched Netflix. And so that's the yeah. key, is that you're trying to come up with what's the most relevant story based on what I'm trying to learn. And then you get to walk into your interview and just ask that question. And then of course, if I, yeah. like, if I ask Amo, tell me about the last time you watched Netflix, I'm gonna get like a three word response. So now it's gonna be like, oh, I watched this movie last night, right? And so now my job is to yeah. pull out the whole story. And that's where I'm looking for all those answers to those more specific questions, but I'm getting them in the context of a single story. And if you're a trio interviewing yeah. together, which is what I would recommend, I would have one person lead okay. the interview. It doesn't mean other people can't jump in and ask questions, but you want one person leading the interview. So again, that participant doesn't feel like they're just being interrogated by this panel of people. Um, but <laughs> with a good yeah. cop, bad yeah. cop uh, yeah. thing, you know. <laughs> and the leading person should be a choice between among them three, or would be like the product owner or the product I actually person. think all three roles need to get comfortable interviewing and they should take turns. And the reason for that is like, let's yeah. say you always let your product manager interview or your product owner interview. What happens when they're out sick? You don't get an interview in, yeah. right? And so yeah. if you want to build yeah. a, ro a really robust habit, the more people on your team that feel comfortable interviewing, that feel comfortable recruiting, that know how to synthesize an interview, the more likely this will become a, a truly team collaborative activity that you'll do week over week. And you also yeah. mentioned that the product trio could be bigger, like more mm -hmm. people. Do you also take them with you to the customer interviews? Because I can imagine there's some sort of limit to make it seem comfortable. Yeah, I, 
at least for the customer side. Yeah, so some teams will add a role to their trios. So maybe they'll have a quad. You want to be careful. Yeah. The bigger your team gets, this is your this is the team that's leading the decision making, right? The more people involved in every decision, the slower you're going to go. Um, it doesn't mean they're the only people involved in discovery. So, um, for example, a trio is typically a product manager, a designer, and an engineer. But you still want the rest of your engineers getting some exposure to customers. So you might rotate them in and out of different interviews. You might okay. share videos with them. Um, if you're working on your go-to-market strategy, you might invite your product marketing manager to be part of an interview. Um, you do need to think about you don't want to overwhelm your customer with how many people are in the room. Um, but you do mm -hmm. want everybody on your team is going to hear different things from the interview. And so there's, there's a couple ways to yeah, do this. Yeah. You could have just two or three people in the interview with the participant and record it and have everybody else watch the videos. Um, a lot of people are really concerned. Like there's four of us right now having a conversation. It feels pretty comfortable. I don't, I don't feel yep. overwhelmed that all three of you are asking me questions. Mm -hmm. So I, I, if you do it well and you keep it casual and you keep the person grounded in their story, I think you can have all three people part yeah. of the conversation. Somebody should take the lead okay. just to help the person stay a little more comfortable. Right. Yeah. And like, That's and why so, we have to host. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> uh, and if I'm not very tired of this interview, I know we did something <laughs> wrong. <laughs> No, but like, I think because we discussed quite a lot internally as well about this concept, right? And at least something that Arno and I always debate a lot is like, okay, you have this trio, but let's say you have a team of eight people, right? And then they go to the, all this discovery work and then suddenly they go to a refinement session. It always feels like in my head, a little bit of like a waterfall yeah. kind of process, right? Like they discover and then they come, they tell the team and the team has questions. They don't know the answers and they come back. And I'm like, yeah, I, I have a hard time somehow understanding, is this actually waterfall or am I just making it up in my own head? Like, because I want the whole team to be there. Yeah, so a lot of teams, even if they're following sort of agile ceremonies, they're still doing mini waterfall, right? If you're writing your requirements mm -hmm. ahead of design, ahead of yep. delivery, yeah. you're doing waterfall. Even if you're doing a three-day sprint, it's still waterfall. Um, and most of us are not doing three-day sprints, so it's even less mini waterfall, right? Um, here's yeah. the thing. Let's say you have an eight-person team. You can't have eight people involved mm -hmm. in every decision. It's going to go really slowly. You can't have eight people involved in inter any interview. So there are, there are sort of practical limits of who can be involved in discovery. But if I have an eight-person team and I have a trio that's leading discovery, my job on that trio is to keep that eight-person team um, apprised of what we're learning every single week. And so if we think about um, sort of agile ceremonies, we have daily stand-ups, we have planning meetings, we have retrospectives. I have lots of opportunities to keep my team up to date on what's happening. And to the detail that yep. sometimes surprises people, like if I'm on a trio and I did an interview today, in tomorrow's stand-up, I'm going to share very quickly what I learned in that interview because I want my team learning what I'm learning at the same time that I'm learning it. And this is why in the book I include this template okay. of an interview snapshot. It's a one pager, it's a visual document. You should be able to talk to it in three to five minutes. And I realize some teams have 50, 15 minute stand ups and you don't want to add an additional five minutes to it. So you got to find the right yep. cadence, so like what's the right moment to integrate this into your process. Mm -hmm. But the idea is that the rest of the team should be following the learning while it's happening. You're not having the trio do two weeks of the discovery and then the first time the engineers hear about yeah, okay. it in that planning meeting that is mini waterfall yeah so if, yeah. if you're doing that that is wrong yeah. yeah so basically then you get a very uh yeah slow process as well because then i guess you lose the how do you say the continuity mm -hmm. to it if you're going to just do a refinement every <coughs> week and then it, okay yeah and how many okay. times and are you do you also use uh, oh sorry yeah I, I was just wondering how many teams can you actually well how many teams do you have with your product trio one like the one. One. So, yeah. one, just one team, right? And that's yeah, a mistake okay. a lot of companies yeah. make. You see these product owners that are yeah, supporting like yeah. five teams. And I'm like, that's, I don't even know how you write user stories for five teams, right? Like that's, that's exactly. insane. Well, I've seen it a few times, so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I agree, but still, <laughs> okay. Yeah, because you should have one. So just to clarify in my own head, right? So correct if I'm wrong. So you have a team of eight people and then there's product managers and let's say this UX and this uh, lead developer senior. Does it, the junior developer also 
can be part of the trio or is only like the most experienced one? Yeah, this is a great question. I think typically it's a, it's a tech lead. It doesn't have to be, right? Because sometimes our tech leads are our system architects. They don't want to spend time with customers. They just want to get into reviewing code and looking at all the details of the data model. And right, they, it's a little bit of a different skill set. Here's the key. The engineer mm -hmm. that participates in the trio needs to be empowered to make discovery decisions. So what we don't want is a junior engineer participating and then like a, a tech lead coming in and saying, no, we can't build that. We're not doing that. So no. it doesn't have to be the tech lead. It has to be somebody with enough seniority to have authority yep. in that conversation. Um, the other thing that I'll say right. is that um, here's like for a lot of teams, the first time the engineers hear about requirements is in that planning meeting, right? So we're going through user stories. Yeah. It's the first time the team's ever heard about it. And what happens in that meeting? Engineers go, hey, have you thought about this? And how many times yeah. are we going back and forth saying, yeah, we thought about this. Here's why we're not doing it that way. And that planning meeting becomes a nightmare. It becomes like a half day, if not full day exercise where, we're, where yeah. engineers are getting to surface their opinion for the first time. Exactly. If instead mm -hmm. the trio is doing a really good job communicating, here's what we learned, here's what we're exploring. And on a good team, on a high functioning continuous discovery team, I would say that conversation is happening daily in small bits, but it's happening daily. Right, and I see a lot of teams yeah. just do this in Slack, like, hey, we had a great interview, here's what we learned. Hey, we got some feedback on this assumption test, here's what we learned. So that by the time they get mm -hmm. to that planning meeting, they're not wondering about all these variations because they followed along with all the variations when they happened. All the work was yeah. exposed. Yeah. And there's this idea, actually, that I really love. It, it's, it's this idea of working out loud. And um, we get this a little bit with engineers with code reviews, right? Like engineers review mm -hmm. each other's work. And, and because you're, all of your work is in a code repository and anybody can view it, there's sort of this like paper trail of everything everybody's done. We can take that idea and replicate it in all realms, right? The more that you expose your thinking and your work while you're doing it, the more that other people mm -hmm. can jump in when they have an opinion while the work is happening rather than in that planning meeting when we're drawing conclusions. Um, and thankfully with tools like yeah. Slack and Microsoft Teams and um, Confluence and all these other tools we have, and like Jira, all these other tools we have for working out loud, there's plenty of opportunities for the trio to make their work visible while they're doing it. Um, so the engineer should not be surprised. Yeah. They should know exactly why they're building what they're building. Yeah, and uh, so you know, I mean, I think this this continuous interviewing thing is uh, you know it, it it keeps on going uh, forever potentially, right? But um, at one point, you need to you know go from these interviews and these learnings into opportunities. Uh, you mentioned them like create an opportunity uh, uh, mm -hmm. map or a tree, even an opportunity tree. And um, I was just wondering, like, how do you define these opportunities in a in in a good way? Because it's really it's really easy to just go you know super global and say like oh you know there's an opportunity to uh, uh, yeah like sticking with a Netflix uh, to get everyone in the family maybe with a separate subscription if we uh, force people with their own virtual headsets or something so <laughs> I was just wondering like yeah you know interviewing these customers you know and going to an opportunity because yeah sometimes customers and business have different interests and there's a, sometimes a bit of a tension between the two. So how do you come from, you know, customer input to actual business ideas that will generate, hopefully? Some... Yeah, okay. So there is a lot of parts to this question. So let's start with... <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> it's a bit, let's, bit let's too broad, maybe. Sorry bit. about that. So I do think you sure, should interview sure. every week. I think once you've done about three yeah. interviews, it's time to start mapping out the opportunity space. But you're going to think about interviewing is yeah. putting, money, putty, putting money in the bank. It compounds over time. So you're not... Even after three mm -hmm. interviews, you probably have enough material to start mapping the opportunity space, but you're never done mapping the opportunity space. It's always yeah. shifting. It's always evolving. Uh, so that's the first thing. And I really do think, like, I have teams start mapping the opportunity space after three interviews. It's pretty shallow. There's, you still have a lot to learn, but it's helping you synthesize yeah. what do we hear, what do we know, where do we have gaps, so it really helps you find what to explore in your next set of interviews. Mm -hmm. um, and then this, so you, there, the the other two parts of your question I heard was one about like, how do we frame opportunities well? And then how do we separate op customer needs and business needs? So if we talk about how yeah, do we yeah. frame opportunities well, opportunities should be framed from your customer's perspective. So like, 
I want to get the okay. whole family subscribed is not a customer need. That is a business need. Nobody who owns Netflix okay. would say, I really wish I could pay yeah. for Netflix five times this month. Right? No, so that's, true. I, that's yeah. actually one of the reasons why I encourage teams to frame them from the customer's point of view, because it helps you catch when okay. you're getting um, pulled away by a business need. Um, so opportunities yeah. should be framed from your Makes customer's sense. point of view. They should be really specific and they occur in a single moment in time. So I see some teams frame opportunities as like, I'm really confused by this interface. It doesn't occur in a single moment in time, at least not how it's phrased, because I could be confused all the time. Mm -hmm. So now I need to get even more specific, like I hate entering a movie title on my remote control when I'm trying to search for a movie. That's a very specific pain point that's now solvable, whereas that first one, I'm really overwhelmed or I'm really confused, like I don't know how to solve that because I don't know what you're overwhelmed or confused by. So as far as framing, the more specific you can get, the better, and then always framing from your customer's point of view. There is... And if you frame super specific, like, don't you, uh, because you also mentioned that it's dangerous to, you know, frame it so that it uh, only will have one solution. Yeah. Because, yeah, okay, uh, it sucks to work from my remote control. So then the solution is to, uh, I don't know, make the keyboard, uh, the keypad interface a bit different. So... Uh, is that also what you mean? Like, yeah, so if I said, not too if specific? I, said I, wanna, um, I wanna use the microphone on my remote to search for a movie, that's a solution, that's not right. an opportunity, right? Yeah, uh, right. I don't Correct. like yeah. typing in a movie title, that's a fine opportunity. I can solve that with voice, I could create, give you a better keyboard, I could make, okay. make it so that you never have to search in the first place, right? I can generate a lot of solutions to that opportunity. Um, this divide yeah. of what's in the opportunity space, what's in the solution space, it's harder than it sounds. Like every yeah. team that I yes. work with, the number one piece of feedback I give is this sounds like a solution. This sounds like a solution. Um, humans think in <laughs> solutions. We have to retrain ourselves yeah. to really be comfortable staying in the opportunity space. <clears throat> Okay, so but what, how do you, what, what's oh. so bad about, oh, sorry, but yeah, I was just wondering, like, what is so yeah. bad about, uh, yeah, just having a solution there? Okay, I, I have the solution. It's right here. Let's do it. Like, what, what's actually the bad thing yeah, about Yeah, so it? you've probably been in um, opinion battle before, right, where you have an idea of what you should build, and maybe Amo has a different idea of what you should build. Yeah. It's really hard to, to overcome that opinion battle, right, because we, everybody digs their heels in, everybody falls in love with their own idea. And usually what's happening in that yep. opinion battle is we haven't even agreed on what problem we're solving. So like yep. um, we've each taken different elements of what we heard and we jumped to a fast conclusion and we're disagreeing on the solutions without even recognizing that we're actually solving different problems, right? So I yep. think there's a lot of strategy yep. and a ro- lot of prioritization that needs to happen in the opportunity space to make sure that first of all, we're solving the most important problems because there's a lot of solutions we could build that provide little teeny tiny incremental value. Like the opportunity space is infinite. So we could build a million things yep. that like somebody will use, but we're missing out on those really higher impact things that solve the most important problems. And how, how do you handle, let's say you go with the Netflix example and say, okay, don't know how to figure out how to type in a movie. Yeah. That's a potential opportunity, and you do the customer interviews, and you, you ask them, and you figure out, well, they actually want to read a book <laughs> instead of doing yeah. this. Like, go abroad Netflix or even abroad your team. How do you handle that? Yeah, so sometimes that's how companies uh, discover adjacent markets, right? So if Netflix finds exactly. if, if Netflix finds that, like, thankfully, I don't think Netflix has to worry about this, but if Netflix finds that, that like, <laughs> no, their broader <laughs> audience is, like, burning out on movies and TV shows and they really want to read more books, then that tells Netflix they, ha- they, they either need to go find different customers who do want to watch movies and, and, and TV shows, or they need to expand mm-hmm. into this adjacent market of reading books. And this is something... But would you still explore it? Would you still explore it and go down it, or would you leave it alone and give it as a note? It really depends. So some teams have the freedom to explore adjacent markets, in which case you would want to explore that in your okay. interview. Some teams don't, right? They're optimization teams, they're really focused on the current product, in which case like going and exploring that in an interview isn't gonna be very fruitful. So some of this too is part of interviewing is making sure we're getting the right people in the room with how we're recruiting and how we're screening for who we're gonna interview and making sure that we're talking to people that in the Netflix case do wanna watch TVs and TV shows and movies Otherwise, it's not going to be a very fruitful interview. Well, I think now you guys touched a point that uh, I had the discussion today about that 
I'm actually quite interested to hear your opinion about it. Uh, because I can imagine like the examples we are giving, right? Like Netflix or Spotify or you guys describe Amazon Prime, right? That you have books and everything. But they are like pretty nice, well-defined products. Uh, but like sometimes, well, actually most of the time, the companies we encounter sometimes, they have like no vision whatsoever in the product, right? And it's like, oh, what is your product vision? Or like, why are you doing what you're doing? And then suddenly, like they don't know which direction to go. So does this trio is meant to come up with a direction or is the trio meant to make it? Like how, how do you see a trio working for a company who doesn't have a clear yeah, vision or where yeah. they want to be? And unfortunately, companies are pretty bad at defining visions. Um, I think in an ideal world, your senior leadership team would be at least developing the framework of that vision, right? Because you need all the teams in your company working towards the same vision. So in an ideal world, your leadership team would be putting putting what Marty Kagan calls the strategic context into place, right? And telling all teams, yeah. this is where we're headed. This is what the, this is the future we're trying to create. And by that, I don't mean these are the features we're going to build. It's just this is the impact yeah. we want to have on the world. And here's our theory for how our product can help us get there. And then the teams yeah. can rely on that strategic context to work on their little individual parts. That's lacking in a lot of companies. So if I'm a product trio and I'm working in an organization that's missing a strategic context, I'm, I'm, I'm going to fill the void. I'm going to make my best guess okay. and get feedback from my leadership team. Because oftentimes, like we see what's so hard about cross-functional collaboration is that oftentimes our most senior teams, which by the way is a cross-functional collaborative team, they don't collaborate well. They can't all, they're not all going in the same direction and that's why we're missing yeah. the strategic context. So what I would do if I was a product trio working in that environment is I would try to fill that void myself based on what I'm learning from customers. And I would work with my leaders to get feedback on it. Because oftentimes just filling the void and giving them something to react to helps to create it. Yeah. Uh, but this might be a stupid question, but do you need a vision if you have done the, uh, in the customer interviews really well? And it's like, okay, we have enough work to make our customers happy for the next five years. Like, yeah, do you then still need a product I th vision? I think you do because I think you, okay. if you just react to the every whatever opportunity. So first of all, in your interviews, you're going to hear way more opportunities mm -hmm. than you can respond to. A good way to yeah. think about this is the opportunity space really is infinite and it's always changing, right? Every time you release code, you're having an impact yep. on the opportunity space. You're addressing some needs, but you're creating new ones, right? So like, we could work yeah. forever and the opportunity space will always be infinite. It's always changing. So if we take that into account, we need some way to prioritize and organize that opportunity space. And the way that happens is by mm -hmm. having a vision of who do we want to serve and what value are we going to create for them? And what's our yeah. theory for how our product is going to do that? And so you could interview and just start reacting to opportunities, but you're very unlikely to be successful because you have no way of identifying yeah. what are the important opportunities. And we see this a lot. A lot of companies create a lot of customer value, but they don't, they're, they're not creating enough business value. So they get shut down or the company goes out of business. Yeah. Or we see the other, yeah. the other thing where we see a lot of companies, especially in the B2B environment, where they just respond to feature requests and they just churn out, they become a feature factory. There is an equivalent in yeah. the opportunity space, right? You can't just respond to opportunity after opportunity. You have to look for mm -hmm the highest impact opportunities. And that requires having a clear outcome, having a clear vision, understanding how you should be prioritizing opportunities. Right. Well, and so, yeah, go ahead, Danique. No, like, because you just mentioned uh, outcomes. And I think that's one of the biggest confusions every time we mention like, yeah, you should focus on outcome on outputs and like uh, people get like, really like, what would be your description to it? Like, what is an outcome and what would be like an output? Yeah, so let me start with what I see a lot of teams do, which is a mistake, is they start with their output. So they start with a solution, a feature, a project, whatever it is. And they say, what mm -hmm. problem does this solve for the customer? And they define an opportunity. And then they say, what impact will it have? And they define an outcome. That's backwards. Yeah. The idea of outcome-focused yeah. product management is to use your outcome to figure out what to build, not to start with your output and derive a out an outcome. So the idea of an outcome is every company, 
has every for-profit company, and actually non-profits have an analogous structure, but every for-profit company is trying to increase growth. The drivers for growth are revenue and increasing revenue and decreasing costs. So to derive outcomes, it's really as simple as saying, how do we, how do we as a company grow revenue, right? Well, we need more, yep. if we're Netflix, we need more customers and we need our existing customers to stick around longer. So now we have two inputs to revenue, customer acquisition and customer retention. Now as a product team, we can say, how can we support those two initiatives? Well, one of the ways that we can drive retention is we can keep our customers engaged. We can get them to watch Netflix more often. Okay, that's a product outcome. How can we drive engagement? Now we can look for what are the customer opportunities, their needs, pain points, and desires, that if we address them, we get them to watch Netflix more. So that's where we might uncover something like, mm. I can't figure out what to watch. That's an opportunity. And if I help solve that opportunity, yeah. you would watch Netflix more. And if you watch Netflix more, you'd probably retain more and our customer company would make more money from you. Right? So I prefer that people start top down with, here's how our company makes money. Here's our theory of how the product is going to support that. And then you're using that outcome to go explore the opportunity space and figure out what to build. Okay. Yep. And so once we have like all these opportunities that we're identifying and like we're, you know, coming up with the, you know, the ones that we need to address, <clears throat> um, you talk about in your book about like, we need to uh, identify and uh, list out all the assumptions that we're having about these opportunities. And as a software engineer, I also sometimes make assumptions and then uh, my code crashes and burns uh, <laughs> sometimes, but luckily I'm a test driven developer, so <laughs> that doesn't happen very often, but uh, because you know, I can think about assumptions all day, but some of them are just so natural and so ingrained yeah. in, 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 in my day to day that it's just, yeah, it's so hard to, to catch them all. So, uh, yeah. And you mentioned something about, you know, pushing through the discomfort to just, you know, keep on writing down these, these, these assumptions. But yeah, is there, is there a structured way of approaching these assumptions and also trying to catch the ones that, that, uh, yeah, are, are so natural for us that, yeah. How do you how do you approach yeah, that? So, <clears throat> because that to me sounds like a really difficult yep. uh, difficult way to uh, to list. Yeah. So the things. challenge with assumptions is that we're blind to our own assumptions, right? Like it's, that's why they're assumptions. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so so first of all, assumption yep. testing is a good way to evaluate solutions. So once you've chosen a target opportunity, I want to encourage teams to work with a set of solutions, setting up a good compare and contrast decision. The way to quickly do that is to test the underlying assumptions because assumptions are what gives you yeah. that compare and contrast data. The problem, of course, is how do I see my own assumptions? Um, in the book, I have a chapter all about identifying hidden assumptions. Um, the primary method that I use for this is to have teams story map the idea. So with a story map, it's just this really con um, simple concept of you imagine the idea already exists and you map out what does mm -hmm. your user have to do to get value out of the solution. And it's literally like a step-by-step okay. map. Um, and then you can go through that map step-by-step step and say, well, what needs to be true for the subscriber or the user um, to be able to do this step? And then that can help you generate assumptions. Mm -hmm. um, another method is you can run a pre-mortem. So a pre-mortem is you imagine it's six months in the future, your product's launched, and it was an unmitigated disaster. Um, in this framing, there's actually some cool psychology behind this. You have to frame it as it did happen not as like it might okay. happen. Yeah. Um, and then it's just a brainstorming exercise. What could have gone wrong? And that will help you start to surface yeah. assumptions. And then I will say, okay. even if you follow all the methods in the book, you're still going to have moments where you release something and it didn't have the impact that you expected. And you have to do the work to say why. When you realize something didn't meet your expectations, you have to dig in and say, what did we assume that wasn't true? Right? So what went wrong? Mm -hmm. And then ask, how could we have learned that sooner? And those two questions, so like, what, why did this not meet our expectations? And how could we have learned that sooner? Yep. Will help um, each team sort of improve their own discovery process. And it will also start to help expose their blind spots. So they can start to see like, oh, we always miss assumptions around data. Or we always miss assumptions around um, usability of even just finding the feature. Right. Yeah. Yeah, because I know you're colorblind, for yeah. example, and that is yeah. something that just, it just never occurs to me, right? When I, I don't know, make down uh, like a design, some, uh, some screen or whatever. So do you also feel that, uh, you know, writing down these assumptions is also something that each member of the product trio should do then in that case to hopefully, you know, catch 
these blind spots that I might yeah, have? Yeah, one of the things I recommend in the ideation chapter is that you start individually and then share your work and then work individually again. And I think this pattern is really powerful yeah. because it forces everybody individually to do the work, but then you still get to build off of each other's ideas. Um, and again, there's some cool research behind that too that just shows that's a really great way um, to pull out all the creative expertise on your team. So when generating assumptions, yeah. I actually think it's really helpful to have everybody do it individually and then share and then try to do it individually again, just to surface as many assumptions right. as possible. And and how would you de then determine which of these assumptions to assumption test? Is there, is there also a, a structured approach yeah. to do that? Because I assume you, you cannot test no, them all, right? It's, it's not only be can you not, like, is it, it's probably not possible, nor should you, right? Because we're not, right. we need to get... We need to ship value to our customers, and we don't. If we waited until there was zero risk in an idea, we would never. We would never ship anything. So it's not about removing uh -huh. all of the risk. It's about mitigating the risk that our company can't handle, right? And that's going to look different in every yeah. company. So um, David Bland has a really great exercise that I include in the book. It's just called assumption mapping. It's a way to really quickly mm -hmm. rate your assumptions relative to each other based on how much risk they carry. Okay. And it's based on how much evidence do you have today that the, that the assumption is true or not, um, and how important is it to the success of your idea. Okay, yeah. I, I, wanna, I wanna pull it to another direction in the sense of, because uh, I, I have a lot of questions in my head, but let's say you have these opportunities, you have those assumptions, and uh, at least the frameworks that I see a lot of product owners using is always based on estimation, yeah. right? The amount of effort it's gonna take for a team to do it. And that's something I completely disagree with. And I'm like, at least the, the argument that I always think about is like, well, what if this estimation is actually wrong, takes much shorter time, and it would have been a huge opportunity, yeah. right? Like, is, yeah, how, how do you see that? Uh, because all the product owner frameworks that I've seen, they take account into estimation. How do I deal with estimation in a product? Today? I stopped asking engineers to estimate user stories in 2003. That's how I feel about that. Okay. Here's the reality. Like it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't take very much time Yay. to figure out that estimating is a colossal waste of time. Like they're never right. Like your, oh. your estimates are never right. A lot of people are disagreeing on that. I know they do. A lot of people are disagree. I know disagree. they do. And it's because <laughs> we have like one foot in each culture. So we have one foot in this, like the world's uncertain. We can't predict the future culture. And we have one foot in mm -hmm. this, like, no, our business needs us to predict the future and we need to tell them how long yeah. things will take and we need to give them a release date. So here's what I'll say about this. I don't think it's possible for an engineer to estimate how long a user story will take. I think that's an impossible task. I think we waste hours, yeah. if not days, in a two-week sprint having engineers task things out. I think a better way to do this is to identify the feasibility assumptions and have engineers do research spikes to explore those specific feasibility assumptions, and then come back with, here's what we learned, not here's how long it will take. Because I, here's the deal, yeah. figuring out how long it will take something to build is a complex, un, unstructured problem that nobody can, no, nobody can, no human, I don't care who you are, can predict the future. And estimating how long it will take an unknown problem is, is basically saying, um, spin the roulette wheel. Give me a number, hopefully it's right. Yeah. And so I think we should stop doing yeah. it. Here's what's hard. Yeah. Sometimes in business, we need to know when something is going to be released. And so I think yeah. the way around this is that the rest of the business has to stop planning around features. That's an output mindset. And has to start planning yeah. around outcomes. So what does this look like? Today, the reason why we need to do the estimates is because we need to know what day it's releasing. Because we need to know when yeah. to do the marketing plan. We need to know when our sales team can start selling it. What if instead of marketing the release of the feature, we market the impact the feature had on our earliest customers? Right? Now we don't need you to estimate. We don't even need to know when it's available. We just need to know you released something in the past. Customers are benefiting from it. I'm going to launch a marketing campaign around that. Right? So we're still stuck in this really messy middle where like some yep. parts of the business have recognized the feature is unpredictable and some parts of the business are still trying to predict the future. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and some some product owners even uh, attach like 
priority to you know things that engineers think is not a lot of work. And then, oh, okay, you know it's a quick win. Let's uh, yeah. put it on top of the backlog, and it has nothing to do with driving the yeah. outcomes or being a, a, a really good the, solution. The famous low hanging yeah. fruits, right? I do yeah. think there will be time, so I will caveat all of this with: there are times when there's a fixed state and we sure. have to have something on time. A really good example of this is GDPR. Yeah. Right? There was a fixed date yeah. in which you had to be GDPR a compliant. Lot. And so in those instances, I think it's about like you have to have, um, you still can't predict the future. You're still not going to get good estimates. So you have to have mm -hmm. expanding and contracting scope. Right? We have yeah. to be get this done by this time period. And if we have time, we can do this much more. Um, and I think that's a much better yeah. way to handle it than to say, so on this date, we will solve this opportunity by how much will be determined by how far our engineers can get. This is a pretty radical yeah. sh mindset shift for business, though. It's going to take time for us to get there. Well, yeah, I can imagine I think... the trio as well, because it's like uh, if I'm going to say to uh, well, a boss, a manager, so like, hey, by the way, you had one person do interview, now you're going to have three. Interview one at yeah. a time. <laughs> yeah. So they're going to be like, what? Three people do the job of one? So it's, yeah, uh... and that's, it takes a little bit of a leap of faith, right? So if you have three people interview together and you have three people making decisions together, it feels inefficient, but you more than make up for it because you're, uh, you're getting rid of all the handoffs, you're getting rid of all the rework when yeah. an engineer gets a user story and a design that they can't implement, which happens all the time, right? Um, and, you're, and honestly, yeah. delivery usually goes faster if... If the engineers have been brought along yep. throughout discovery. Yeah, for sure. And I had w one more question about the assumptions. It's kind of jumping back, but I, oh. I thought it was so uh, thought provoking when I when I read it um, because I've never really considered it. Uh, but you mentioned that one area that product teams often overlook is ethical yeah. assumptions. Could you could you could you give an example of an ethical? This assumption? is a really big topic, and I actually um, the one regret I have about writing my book is. I wish I had done a whole mm -hmm. chapter on this on this category because I think it's this right. important, and I probably will follow up with like a little mini book on it. Um, ethical okay. assumptions come in. A, I think there's a lot of sort of landmine um, areas for us to explore. And the first is around data, right? As an industry, we're pretty terrible about the what, about how much data we yep. ask for, how we store it. Like all these data breaches are ridiculous. Yeah. Um, how we use it, who we sell it to, how transparent we are with customers about it. Like the mm -hmm. fact that this most this upcoming Apple release is so controversial, like marketers are terrified that if they have to tell their customers that we track email opens, that it will break their industry. Like we're clearly doing something wrong. Like that, that we're clearly yeah, yeah. doing yeah. something wrong if transparency means your customers would opt out. That's a really good indicator that you're doing something unethical, right? Yeah. Um, so that's the first thing is just data is a huge area to explore. Do your customers understand what you're doing? Are they okay with it? Would they opt in? Forget this opt out, would they opt into that? Um, I think yeah. a second area, I think 2020 raised these issues quite a bit, is just um, social justice issues. Who are we including? Who are we excluding? And this can fall on the, on the yeah. sort of um, gender, race, ethnicity lines, but it also falls on ageism, able bodiedism, um, whether you have access to a broadband connection or you're in a rural area with only a dial up connection. Um, yeah. Every product team is making usually implicit decisions about who they're serving. And because they're implicit, they're not recognizing who's being left out. And so we're replicating the mm -hmm. inequities we see in our communities and our products. And I think as product people, we could play a much bigger role in helping to correct for some of those inequities. Um, there's um, the way that we test. So a lot of us test with A-B testing. And if it works for the majority, yep. we release it. And we forget to ask who was in that minority yep. that we're not working for. And are we OK with those consequences? Um, so there's a lot right. there uh, that I feel like we could dig into. I'm just starting to scratch the surface in a lot of the, these areas. I, I really want to like rework yeah. my entire framework um, to better account for this. Because uh, I think that um, I have a hard time with like, how do I address these issues in my community? Because I'm not, I don't work in the public yep. sector. But I do know that I can help address these um, considerations in the product world. And I think that's my next year plus is just going to be looking at how can I use the voice that I have to raise awareness around these issues. Yeah. Sounds like a full episode on its own. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do have another question. Well, we are almost out of time, but uh, I want to get your point yeah, on go this. Ahead, like, uh, 
like a lot of this continuous discovery comes in the sense of like a company who wants to keep growing, like as you described, like increasing the amount of money they get or cost. But like, do you think this trio would also fit in a company who is in maintenance mode? Like, we don't per se want to grow. We have this product is in house and yeah, we just want to keep it and cost to the minimum. Would that something market. That you would yeah, market is dying. Would you? Would that something that you would advise? Yeah, so I forget who said this. Some, maybe Peter Drucker, some business thinker said, if you're not growing, you're dying. And I think there's some truth to that. And I don't, I don't subscribe to the like grow as big at all costs, like even in my own business. I actually constrain yeah. my growth intentionally um, because I'm, I'm trying to balance impact with quality of life. And I could grow my business yeah. um, infinitely and destroy my quality of life. So I don't subscribe yeah. to the mm -hmm. like growth at all costs. But I do think that if you're not um, doing continuous discovery, you are probably um, degrading or eroding at a faster rate than you realize. Because the opportunity space is always evolving. And if you don't have an ear to the ground, keeping tabs on what's happening in your market, um, your, your market's going to leave. And I think, I think 2020 yeah. was a really big dose of that for a lot of companies. A lot of people were in stable, yeah. slow changing um, industries that yeah. radically changed overnight. All right. So, uh, yeah, I guess we're, uh, we're out of time here. I think we have a, a lot more questions for you, Teresa, but uh, we, will, uh, we will let you go because you are a very busy <laughs> woman. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much for being here. Uh, I learned a lot and, um, yeah, everyone go pick up a copy of her book, continuous discovery habits. I got the Kindle version. I think Arno actually got a physical copy. Yeah. So, uh, like well recommended. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, thanks again for yeah, being thanks here. Thanks for having me. This was a really fun conversation. All yeah. right. Well, like glad you enjoyed it. it. Yeah. It was a pleasure to me. Thanks a lot as well. And, uh, I wish you had another hour, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Maybe next with the time. next book, right? Next time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. I also would like to thank the listener. You know where to reach us for uh, suggestions uh, at podcast at fourscouts.nl or uh, Twitter at fourscouts. Uh, you can also send us a message on Anchor. We would love to hear from you. All right. That wraps it up for this one. Thank you, everyone. And bye. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of ScoutCast, Roasting Marshmallows, with your host, Rolf Sir. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit 4scouts.nl and on Twitter at 4scouts. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave a review and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time on ScoutCast, Roasting Marshmallows.